Hi guys, I have one surprise for you this evening in my case. I found Perry who's going to be with us this evening. I found him through an online Facebook group. He's launched a book. It's an amazing book. I've read 80% of it. Like, like it's really thick <laughs> and really dense. And I wanted to bring him on today to share about his story, his experience, the people that he reunited in a way through his book and the message of his book, which is about surviving and thriving after sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So with no further ado, hi Perry, welcome. Hello, hello, thank you. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you for bringing me on. Yeah, I thank really you appreciate for, it. Yeah, thank you for accepting and super thank you and my appreciations for writing the book. It's an amazing piece of work. I'm not just saying this as a coach. I'm saying this as a woman, as a human being that can relate to some of those things that I found in the book. It is an act of courage and I want to acknowledge you as such. And yeah, uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, what you've been through to write this book. So I'd love to. Yeah, that. sure. Yeah, no. So I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm from London in the UK, come from what most people would call a broken home. So my biological mother, she walked out when I was four. Uh, although a few years later, she came back into my life. We have a great relationship now, so that's great. But back then she walked out, so it was just me and my dad. So he raised me as a single parent. My stepmom came into to our lives a few years later. Um, I was the best man at their wedding, which is cool. I was like a nine-year-old child with holding the ring, it's just being a complete boss. <laughs> it was my day. It wasn't their day. They think it was their day. It wasn't their day. It's my day. <laughs> and and so that, that was really cool. And uh, my dad's mum, so my nan, her husband, so my technically step-granddad, they lived um, 15 minute walk from our house. And I would go around there fairly regularly growing up because I was very close to my nan, very regularly. And then when I was 11, 11 and a half in age, we was, there was a bunch of us. It was like a family gathering. It was all around my nan's house. So it was all sitting in the living room, people on the couches. And uh, we was all watching TV. We was all watching this TV show called Eggheads. And I don't know if anybody knows it. I don't think it's not on anymore. It's, it's an old time TV show. It's a bit, basically a panel of super intelligent people solving the hardest questions but up against your regular person, right? Uh -huh. So there's two teams, world's oh. smartest against your, your, you know, your average person type of thing. And I was all watching this. My stepmom was sitting on the couch and I was sitting on my granddad's lap, right? I was 10, year, 10 well, I was 11 years old, sitting on my granddad's lap watching TV. He had his arm over the, the arm of the chair, right? And he had like a rolled up cigarette in between his two fingers. And my stepmom was watching TV. Out the corner of her eye, she sees his cigarette butt jump, like, uh, sorry, not jump, uh, leave his fingers, fall onto the floor. And she's like, oh, assuming he was going to just pick it up. And moments go by and he doesn't. She's, she's wondering, why is he not picking up his cigarette that's burning a hole in the carpet? And then she just sees some movement and then her spidey senses just blew, just blew up, right? And then she just went off the couch, walked out of the room, called me. I then followed her into the kitchen. I don't remember any of this. I don't remember any of that, right? And uh, she called me into the kitchen and she asked me a few questions and then she brought my dad in and then we went home. But apparently in that car journey home, he was asking me what was going on. And I said to them that, uh, what my granddad was doing. And the story is for about a year and a half, up until that moment, he was molesting me. He was sexually abusing me um, constantly. Every time I went around there, it would be with people in the room, people in no room. Um, doesn't matter. And it, it was a funny one because then when, when we got home, we, I, never went around, I, I never went back to my nan's house. My dad told me to keep it secret. He's like, I don't want people knowing about sexual abuse in the family. I don't want people to think of the power name and they automatically just think of sexual abuse. So don't tell your friends, don't tell anybody. And you're not allowed to run to your nan's house anymore. So I never went around my nan's house. So I used to go around there regularly, never went uh, around there again until my granddad had a heart attack about two years after that. And he died at work 
And then I started to go back around there again, see my nan again. But so all throughout my teenager years, I was just, I mean, it's fine. I was just this teenager. I wasn't really thinking about what happened, you know. Then I grew older and things started to come up on the news about sexual abuse, about rape, about things like this, right? All, all of the terms that fall under the umbrella of, you abuse. know, of, of abuse, right? And because back then, when I'm 10, we're talking 16, or 17 years ago, it wasn't a thing. No, not really. You know, 17 years ago, it wasn't plastered all over the news all the time. It wasn't, people weren't talking about it on the street. It wasn't, it's, it's still taboo, but it was very taboo 17 years ago. So growing up, I, I must have been, uh, 16, 16, 17, my nan passed away and we sold her house, right? So from the money of that house, we moved out of London, moved to, moved to Berkshire. And it's interesting, right? Because I, um, growing up, I, which now looking back is because of the abuse. I wasn't good with women. I wasn't good in the social aspects. I was a virgin, you know, like I wasn't good. And I was very introverted, right? When I was like 16, 17 years old. But I didn't like those traits about me, right? I didn't like that. I didn't like that, those facts. And when I moved to a new location, I was like, this is my opportunity to be someone else, right? Nobody knows me here. So I created this character. At, this, at the time, I, I knew what I was doing, but what I soon came to, realize, came to realize, which I'll talk about in a second, is actually like what the label is of that, right? And I created this character. So when I went to this new college, I was like, right, when I walk into these college doors, I'm going to be the player. I've slept with loads of girls. I'm really social, right? I'm funny. I'm confident, right? I'm the man, right? And that was your story, the one that you told people. That I told myself and that I told people, yeah. Uh-huh. Right? Well, I told myself I acted in that way and they got the message from my, from my, the way I was, right? Mm-hmm. Type of thing, you know? And the fake it till you make it was literally it. I faked it, right? Until I made it. And then that, that lie, that story became a reality. And I was that person, right? And that was all great back then. I thought I was high on life, you know? I was, it was great. Until... Until I was, um, until I was, I don't know, I was in my early 20s. In my early 20s, I came back from traveling with my partner at the time. We moved into our first house and then moved into my, yeah, into our first house. And then we, I watched, this book came out called Mask and Mask and Any by Lewis House. And I saw an interview with him from, uh, he was on with Ellen DeGeneres and he was speaking about his book and he was speaking about a mask in particular, about the mask that he used to wear when he was around women. And he literally explained, right, exactly what I'd been doing for so many years since the age of 17, since I moved to Berkshire. But I didn't realize, I, I didn't realize, it's a very interesting one. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't realize it was, um, something that had a label because other people were doing it too, like Lewis in that situation. Mm-hmm. And when I realized that, I was like, Jesus. I was like, okay. When well, my partner came home and then I said to her, I was like, listen, I was like, babe, you know that guy you fell in love with? That player, that guy, he slept around? She's like, yeah. I was like, that wasn't me. And she's all like, what are you talking about? I'm like, <laughs> there was one girl that I slept with before you. And then her jaw dropped and she's like, like she couldn't believe it. And then I told her about, but that was the first time I, was, I ever, I felt naked because I was super vulnerable. I was prepared for her to walk away because I was a complete lie. And I uh, told her about the abuse of my granddad. And then she just welcomed me with open arms. And then that kind of was the start of the process of uh, confronting my story in a way and sharing. And then, um, and then from there, once you skip a few, I, that then led me to... Um, that led me to sometime later, June the 1st, 2017, my dad passed away from a heart attack out of the blue. And I then wanted to dive into his story because he was an alcoholic for three years prior to his death. And I went to realize why you don't, you don't, you know, somebody isn't born racist, right? Somebody 
don't just become an alcoholic because they want to. There's a reason. It's a cat, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a response. It's a coping mechanism for something. And I wanted to know what that coping mechanism was for, but I, I, I couldn't find the answer to it. Anyway, I then watched a film called Spotlight. Um, I don't know if any of uh, any uh, listeners or yourself have watched Spotlight. Have you have you seen it? No, I read it in your book because you mentioned that also, but I didn't get a chance yeah. to watch it yet. I'm gonna watch it. Oh, it's so such a don't don't blow it for me. <laughs> no, no. Just, yeah, <laughs> I'll watch I won't, it. I won't. I won't. I, <laughs> yeah. I'll just say what like what it's about. The synopsis, which you can find online, it's just about okay. a team of uh, journalists in Boston in this could very well be wrong. I can't remember what year, but just say it's like the 60s or the 70s back then. And um, they get whiff of a case of a priest molesting a child. But nobody wanted to dive into that story because, you know, Church, not, right only is it, yeah, not only is it very taboo in the 60s and 70s, but we're talking about priests, right? People of God, like, you know what I mean? We're talking like of that. So they're like, you got to be crazy. One, obviously it's fake. Of course, of course it's not true. But then this very brave person that grew into a very small team was like, no, this has come from somewhere. I don't care what high power they're from, but you know, they're, they're still a human being. Is there truth to this? And I dive into that story. And it's not one priest molesting one child. It's priests all over the world molesting kids all over the world. Mm-hmm. And I remember before my dad died, it was a few months before he died, he was in a car. And he said to me, he goes, oh, you know that spotlight film? I said, yeah. He goes, well, at the end of the film, before the credits come up, there's a list of churches um, and places and schools all around the world where priests had been molesting kids. And he goes, where your granddad grew up, the school that he went to is listed in there. And, I was, and he just dropped that bombshell out of nowhere as if like, you know, come on. <laughs> okay, then. And he never gave me any context. And then I found out after he passed away, I then... Um, shared my story about abuse because I'm tired of living in silence. And then I found out from my auntie, my dad's sister, that my auntie, my cousin, whose story is in my book, and my dad were all victims of sexual abuse from the same man. And I was like, okay, the dots are connecting. It makes sense. My dad was molested growing up by the same man and he lived in silence. And that is why um, I remember the last time I saw him, he came around my house, he was drunk, just had an argument with my mum. He left the house, my house, again, to go back home. And then I texted him saying, why are you drinking so much, Dad? And he said, to fight away the demons. And at the time, I was like, what demons are you, what, what, what demons what are you, are you fighting, about? Dad? Yeah, what are you talking about? And then I realized those are the demons in his head that have been growing like a virus. Because when you're living in silence, right, different things. When you're living in silence, one, you feel like you're the only person going through it. Why? Because you're not talking to anybody about it. So you feel like you're the only one going through it. And then the other thing is, if you're living in silence, you will be asking yourself questions, like in your head, right? In my experience, Perry, why did you go through that for a year and a half without saying anything? Does that mean you enjoyed it? Were you a sick kid? You know, like, are you a weirdo? Are you an outcast? But then these questions come into your head and sometimes you're going to provide an answer back to that because you're not asking anybody else that question so if you're asking this it's like you're putting yourself into like a, a mental interrogation room right and you're just questioning yourself and questioning yourself and and it just sends you down a, this road of self-sabotage if you're not aware of the answers that you're giving yourself right because whatever you feed energy into it grows so if i'm feeding energy into the fact that i'm blaming myself for what happened because i didn't speak out what's going to grow that blame and it's like a domino effect you know, it, it, everything, everything just, and that's exactly what happened to me. And, and then, um, and then last year I joined forces with a, a friend of mine. We started the charity called We Rescue Kids. And then in the first lockdown of last year, mm-hmm. I started to work on this book called Breaking the Silence. And then I, um, and then I brought it out Friday and it's number one bestseller in the UK, uh, for mental health. And in the U S it's number one bestseller for sexual abuse. Yeah, and this is just Tuesday now, so it's not even a week <laughs> since, since I know. put out the book. <laughs> yeah, I know. I I can't believe it. I I, I of course, you know, I'm not going to write a book and and be like it's not going to do well. You you know, you don't do that. You write a book hoping, crossing your fingers, it's going to do well. But I didn't think it it was going to be like this. You know, the um, power of the stories. Yeah, one of them is of amazing. Course. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. And that's what I wanted to do. Like, to, to, in the early days of it, in its infancy stage, I was like, right, I want to write a book 
it's going to be about my story, but I don't want it to just be about my story. It needs to be about other people too. And I was, trying, I was like, how can I do that? How can I do that? And then I, um, my, um, I joined TikTok in its early days, right? Yeah. And when you go into, when, now it's different. Everybody's on there doing any, anything and everything. But back then, we were talking November 2019. Go on there and it's just kids singing, teenagers dancing, dancing yeah. right? Just being happy. And you've got Perry Power coming on there with this, with this story about sexual abuse. It's like, whoa, all right. Yeah, and heavy. Then, yeah. yeah, heavy. But I, know, but I knew that. And I was like, I don't care what this platform is for, right? I don't want to follow its rules, right? I'm going to do my own thing. Because, because prior to that, when I very first started my story, I was speaking a lot to adults, right? Adults who were molested when they were kids and they're still living in silence. And we'll be going back and forth. But I wasn't speaking to kids and teenagers, primarily because they're not really in my audience on Facebook and I'm not really in my audience on Instagram. And I knew that they were all on TikTok. So I was like, why not? I'm a big believer in the universe. I'm a big spiritual guy. If the universe is like, dude, you need to get on TikTok and share this. And if it, if it blows up, it's, it, it's meant to be. So I put my story out there, my personal one. And now it's like, it's at like a quarter of a million views. And then about four videos later, I was like, right, I'm going to do a story of my dad about how he died living in silence um, with, from alcohol abuse. And now it's at 5.9 million views. Wow. And, and, and it compl- when I say it blew up, I mean, it blew up. And I was getting in its, in its like peak of that video, I was getting anywhere between low end, bare minimum five, to the highest end of 15 to 20 DMs, messages on my Instagram from kids and teenagers, right? I'm talking as young as seven, eight, nine years old right wow. and they were all either three three different types of messages one was hey perry thank you i saw your video thank you for sharing your story you're going to be helping so many people one type of message two perry thank you for sharing your story i went through something similar a while ago and i'm still living in silence wow. or message number three was hey perry thank you for sharing your story i'm going through this right now as in in the present right now the is very weird the last type of message the present stories didn't come to much later on i don't know why but it, it didn't in, in the beginning it was all the first two types of messages but i remember the first one i got right and it just really like i didn't i, I couldn't I, I couldn't uh handle it well i didn't manage it well it was a video from this girl uh, the video a message from this girl who was living with her mom and her uncle her uncle would rape her constantly and her mum would burn cigarette butts and out on her. And she was like, what do I do? Right. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I, and I was like, I'm not trained for this. Yeah. I, I was like, I'm not a therapist. I don't want to be a therapist. It's, that's not my thing. Right. Leave that to the professionals who spend days and years in it. Right. I'm not that guy. I'm just here with a message. Break your silence. What comes after breaking your silence, right. Or before it, but you know, not necessarily after the, you know, get a therapist like as soon as possible, whatever stage you're at. But, uh, but I was like, I, I, Jesus, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and then I, I didn't reply back to her, mm. right? And I sort of replied back to everyone because it is like for, for a moment, I, um, I almost as if like I took this responsibility on to, with this expectancy, the soul of the, to help them all within the moment, right? And I didn't know how to do it. I wanted to, but I didn't know how to. And, and then it dawned on me one day, I was meditating and it dawned on me that I was like, hold on, Perry, when you first shared your story, was you looking for somebody to give you, right, a solution? I was like, well, no, I didn't want a solution. I wanted ears. I wanted somebody there to just listen. That's what I wanted. And to not laugh at me, right? No judgment. And I was like, ha, huh. these kids reaching out to me with their stories, they're not looking for a solution necessarily. They're just looking for me to be like, I hear you. Okay, I hear you. I see you. I love you. It's okay, right? There's no judgment here. You can talk to me. And then I went back to her, went back to everyone. And then uh, what's, what kind of like sparked the book is because I remember being this one girl who um, she was living at home with her mum and her stepdad and they were abusing her uh, sexually and uh, physically and emotionally, everything under the sun. And she said to me that she doesn't know what to do, right? And I, I, say to, and I said to her, I said, well, first step, therapy. And I need to get that. And I always get that out there. 
therapy, therapy, therapy. Um, and and I and then she said about going to the police. And I said to her, I was like, listen, do you feel like that is the right thing to do? Like, I would never say you should go and to the police. Do that, yeah. But I, yeah, yeah, I'll never be in a position of you should go and do. I'll be in a position of what do you feel like you should do? What do you feel like you can do? And then she's like, well, I feel like I should be going to the police. I, you know, and I said, okay, well, if you feel like that's the thing you should do, then I just want you to know that you do have the power and the strength and the courage to do that. And we was going back and forth. Conversation died down. And I followed up with her about two or three months later, just before the book. And, uh, and it was crazy because it was the first like, outcome that blew my mind. And she said, because of our conversation, um, she's like, I took, imagine this, right? She goes, I took my mum and my stepdad to court. She took them to court, right? How old is she? She was uh, 15, 16, right? She took her mum and her stepdad to court and, and the, the judge signed like the, the, the custody of the daughter over to the, to the, basically the dad, her actual dad was fighting for custody, but he was never winning the battle. Mm-hmm. Because she was at home with the mum and the stepdad and, and to the law and nothing's going on at home. But this this girl didn't have the courage. She'd be like, no, the things are going on at home. Probably way beyond your imagination. I don't have necessarily I don't have video footage and stuff like that. But she took them to court and she um she got tests done on her because very, very um uh just v- like relatively just before she went to court, she was raped by the stepdad, right? And, and they managed to get the proof for it that they needed. And, um, and then uh, she went over to the dad for custody. And now she's living with the dad. And that was crazy. And, that was, and I was like, wow, that's incredible. And then um, I then reached out to a bunch, of, a bunch of kids and teenagers and young adults. I was like, listen, I'm writing a book. I want your story in my book. I know you haven't shared your story out before. If you're comfortable with doing so, you can put your story in my book for the first time. And you can either have your name attached or you don't have to have your name attached. And there's 14 stories in part two of the book, part two or three. And um, yeah, uh, seven or eight of them are, eight of them are named, seven of them are unnamed. Yeah. And what I found was amazing. First of all, um, this was the first book that I read from people that were simply sharing their stories. This was not somebody coaching anybody. This was not somebody giving life recipes or success recipes. No, this was just a testimonial book, if I can call it like that, or um, just life, real genuine life stories book from people that are living among us right now. And what I found also surprising was that in my country, first of all, um, that's Romania, Southeastern Europe, people still don't understand the notion of abuse. And a lot of people think just of rape. Rape is just on the extreme of it. There's Mm. abuse that can be done. You know, you can be spoken to, touched, uh, made to do things against your will, as was the case with many of the people that shared, including you. You were being touched and subjected to practices that you didn't want to, which included, yes, sexuality. And what, first of all, there's that because there's the entire spectrum there. And secondly, there were men sharing, men sharing. In my country, we have a lot of women who share about rape, abuse, and people are still surprised because we think that our country is very peaceful in that sense. But this stuff also happens here, but men don't talk about it. The only side that we hear when it comes to men is that there are the abusers or the rapists or some of them even killers because sometimes things degenerate. So now here's this book with at least, if I recall from the named people, three, you, a Romanian guy. And then there was another man. He shared a story. Jacob Kaufman. Yeah, I think so. I don't remember the name, but he was in a camp somewhere and his friends all did stuff to him. Yeah. Yeah. And first of all, when I saw the Romanian man's name there, I was like, oh my God, this is a Romanian guy. He's speaking about this. And the fact that also, yeah, so there were men and the, the sensitivity there, that's unbelievable. I don't know what it's like in your country, like in UK, to speak about you as a man, speak about your abuse and how you're regarded how does how does that affect your work 
or just your social life or your standing with other women, I maybe you can share a little bit about that. Yeah, I um, it's definitely getting better mm -hmm. in the UK with men sharing. I know it's 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 still not as bad as um, especially Eastern European countries um, in regards to speaking out with men. Um, it, it it really isn't, but it's it, it's still bad everywhere, right? It's still bad in the UK with men not owning their story, men not speaking out because of whether it's ego issues or or what they perceive as masculinity, or what you know, and and not speaking out about it. Uh, a whole host of, that's just two out of many many reasons as to why they're not. But in the UK, it's it's bad, but it's getting better. And I, and I know that because I'm seeing it, right? It, it definitely is. I am, um, like, I have, when I first went live with the whole TikTok thing and all these people are messaging me, 95, and that's, that's a minimum, 95% of all those messages were all girls and women. Very few were boys or men. But the, it, it, the percentage is probably still like that. But, there definitely is a very, very ever so slight shift in more men speaking out. So I know that that's hope because that will just continue to escalate. And that's why with this book, right? I think the reason why one is doing well, but it's, I think because of the whole, just because it's, it's, a, it's a book, like you mentioned earlier, how it's just stories of people sharing, right? It's not like this, this coaching article or anything like that. It's just a platform. This book is, is a platform for people to walk onto and share. It's essentially what I wanted to make it be. We've obviously some type of coaching, um, coaching aspect like the, in part three, I try to give advice on how somebody can break out their silence. But you'll see on this book, my, my face is on the front cover, right? Now, I did that on purpose because if you see this on a shelf in a bookstore, right, or being plastered everywhere on social media, I want my face to be on the front because I want to make a statement that yes, I'm a man. Yes, I was sexually abused, but I'm owning that shit, right? That's my story, right? Yes, I'm going to walk down the street and somebody's going to recognize me. But like, oh, that's the guy who sexually abused you. Yeah, that's me. But I'm doing that on purpose because I want to show other men that it's okay for them to also say, yes, I went through that. Yes, that's me. Yeah. You know? what also struck me was there were some similarities as I was reading your story. So, um, it's, it, they're not identical, but I, it brought stuff from my past related to mm. something that happened to me, except that I've always been a big mouth. So when I was a, 11 years old, I got a man's penis <laughs> right in my pants. And I spoke, like, I went home. I went straight to my grandparents because they were home. And I said, this happened, blah, 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 blah. I, like, I spilled it then and there. I never even, like, it never even crossed my mind that people wouldn't believe me. Mm -hmm. And also the thing that struck me was, so that never happened. Like, my grandparents took matters in their own hands and they spoke to that man, which was a neighbor, and end of story. Nothing ever happened after that. And secondly, it was my dad. My dad would also went through abuse, not sexual abuse, from his father. And my dad smoked and drank, or drank, sorry, a lot. And he died at the age of 48. Oh, wow. Yes. Same age, eh? Yeah, same age. And um, my mother found out, so my mother had divorced my dad um, when I was about eight. And she found out after he died and after our granddad also died uh, from our grandmother, she eventually shared how my granddad was treating my dad when he was a little boy. And my granddad was a military uh, colonel, colonel and he was really, really strict on my dad. If he was even late as a few minutes, he'd sleep on the stairs, on the staircase of the building if he was late for several minutes past supper or anything, he wouldn't eat. He would just starve until the next day. And apparently he was also very um, physically aggressive to my dad. So no sexual uh, abuse, any, but 
otherwise psychological, yeah. emotional, and physical abuse still. And my mother never understood why my dad was just, he was a smart man, but he just didn't, his life didn't connect somehow, just didn't build any, nothing. And in this case, it was my grandmother's courage to eventually come clean and tell my mother what had happened to my dad when he was a child. And he never, he could never keep a job. He could never, he just couldn't hold a steady life. Yeah. And my parents were born in the fifties and my mom's still alive. She's 70 now, but she never went to psychotherapy. She never went to counseling. This stuff didn't happen in our country back then. Yeah. I, I don't know what it was like in Great Britain, but I feel that right now it's us, the younger generations that are starting to realize the importance of, look, this is, this is happening and this is transgenerational. And most of the people that abuse have been abused themselves. And although yeah. I don't know what happened to my granddad, he must have, something must have happened to him in order to treat his child mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, those, those were the similarities. Yeah. That, that's what your book, brought, your book brought up for me. And when I read, I was like, wow, 11, me, 48, dad. I'm like, okay, different causes. So my dad had lung cancer, didn't have, die of a heart attack, but it was still because of the drinking, smoking and not eating enough and not sleeping well and so on. So yeah. still that, that's how he, he didn't treat himself. He just held it in until it got to him from within. So I don't know how many other people are like that out there, but yeah, yeah definitely yeah. related to that. And I'm hoping to reach out to the okay. Romanian guy that shared in your book. I was so surprised that he shared there because he's my age and men my age in our country, they don't share that. Like the stigma and the level of shame here, unbelievable. So, and I don't know from the unnamed, like aside from this man that was Romanian, I, I don't remember, I feel that the rest of the people, at least the ones that gave their name were British. Uh, most of them were. And I think somebody from Illinois, a woman. Illinois, you, two, yeah. I, yeah, well, yeah, in Illinois, two of the um, unnamed ones were Pakistani. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, one of them, um, he, he mentions it in the book, because Vla um, Vlad mentions it in the book in regards to, uh, it's interesting, not all of them, but some of the, when a guy shares a story with me um, about the abuse, sometimes, more often than not, there's this confusion as to whether, because they were molested or raped or whatever, by a guy when they were younger, does that mean that they are gay and that they should be attracted to men? And, and, and I spoke about that in regards to Vlad, and I remember having a really, really in-depth conversation with one of the unnamed uh, people, um, especially coming from a Pakistani background, you know? Um, and like, like, for example, he was saying to me that he's, he is gay, right? He's, he's had, Many relationships with men. He's single though, but many relationships with men. He goes, but he goes, but there's always been this voice in my head as to, but am I gay? Mm. You know? And I, and I said to him, I said, well, listen, all I can say on that is just because you were, just because your first ever sexual experiences were with men doesn't mean you need to follow that suit, right? It can do if that's what you want is a thing. What do you want deep down? Right. If you're like, oh, but I'm attracted to women, but I, but I'm so used to men because it started off as, with the man, you know, then that's where the gray area lies. And that's where, um, that's where questions need to be asked. You know, like, it's, like I said to him, like, listen, I said, bro, <laughs> it's fine that you're gay. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, but it's just, if you feel like you're doing it out of this pressure or out of this confusion, then that's where that's where like things need to be figured out, you know? And therapy or counseling help a lot of course. there. And there we go. And there we go. Yeah. 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 So Perry, I want to acknowledge you for the courage of writing that book and showing your face here and all the other places. Like, by the way, tell us a little bit since the book launched on Friday, what has been going on with you? Like, what is your experience now? It's um, it's 
it's just been absolutely blown up. So I was thinking about where it is on Amazon and now podcasts are just coming through thick and thin. You know, can you come on a podcast? Can you come on a show? I, yes, yesterday, last night, I was on like a, it's this radio show called Crew Radio. It's actually pretty cool. It, it started off on, the, on an airliner and now it's bigger than that. But it's like an, a, a radio show on airplanes. And so that was cool. So I was live on radio last night. And then this morning, I get uh, a message through from somebody who works for BBC Radio. Um, and I'm going on to BBC Radio next weekend. And my plan is, like me personally, I want to be the guy. I want to be the guy who, who helps. Listen, I want to help everybody break their silence, right? Mm. But I, I'll tell the truth. I want, I want the main focus for me is to help men break their silence because I'm a man. My, yeah, my, my dad died in silence and I don't want that to happen, right? So whereas this is going to help everyone, I, I do want to be known as like the, the man who's like, I don't want to say lead in a way that's, that seems a bit egotistical, but like, you know what I mean? Like, as in like, I'm, I'm, when, I'm on, when I'm on radio, when I'm on uh, news channels, when I'm doing my thing is to get this message out there where like men, you know, the ego, the masculinity, that's these, these, um, expectations that you are living under right they need to be removed and then they need to because it's it's, it's a self-sabotaging journey so what i'm going to be doing is is hopefully uh, from the radio show next weekend the next opportunity and just keep on escalating it and escalating it and escalating it until the message is heard by more and more and more people and this book is in more and more, and more hands like i want this book I don't know how I'll go about it, but I want this book in as many schools as possible, mm-hmm. right? Now, I know schools is the gray area because this is a very heavy topic. So, but that is something that I will fight because there's a statistic, right? That there's one child in every classroom who's going through abuse. I didn't right? know about the statistic. That's one out of every 20. Oh, uh, yeah. So one, one in every classroom because in children-wise, it's one in every, I think it was like one in every 25. So to have one in 20, one in every 25 is one in two. But in the classroom, Depending on the school, you, you're looking at anywhere between 15 to 20 kids. So my classroom, was on, when I was at school, you're looking at, uh, it's probably more than that, it's probably about 25 kids in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, one child in every classroom is going through or have been um, mm-hmm. sexually abused. Uh-huh. And that is a study just um, in Great Britain or is it global or European or? That, that, well, that study was American. Uh-huh. So that, was an Ameri- okay. that was an American study. So I know that it's either going to be the same or very, very similar, um, you know, um, everywhere else, whether that's one child in, in every two classrooms in a different country or whatever, but it's still going to be uh, a shocking figure. So I, I want it to be in, in the hands of, in schools and, you know, things of that nature. Maybe studies will be done, especially on boys, what happens to them as they grow up. How much are they exposed to this kind of aggression? And not yeah. just from kids their age, but from uh, adults, because that's where, that's where I feel that it's not explored enough. Mm. So specifically around men. Speaking yeah. of which, on my channel, on the YouTube channel, I have 70% men. What would you say to them? Like, what would your message be to these 70% men? Most of them are from the United States and the second country is India. That's, those are the analytics on my channel. I, um, I would say that if you're, I'll speak to two different type of men here. If you're a man who has been sexually abused in your story and you're blocking it because of two reasons, because you don't want people to know and you don't want to face your own story yourself, it might seem easy to keep on blocking it. It might seem easy for it to come up today, right? For you to, to turn this YouTube video off and forget about it, move on to the next activity in your day. And that's it. It might seem easy. It will get to a point though, where that will take its toll. It will get to a point where, where you blocking this, that part of your life will show up in different areas. It will show up in your relationship with your partner. It will show up in how you're running a business. It will show up how you're treating people in the office. It will show up in other areas. And that will lead to the next thing, right? Um, and I am the, the best person to speak about this because it comes from experience of my dad, right? 
and it, it led from different things. And there is no positive outcome. There is no positive outcome from you pushing your story down and keep on doing it. It does not lead anywhere that's pretty. It's nasty. And it's either nasty for you or it's nasty for you and those surrounding you. Mm-hmm. So the time is the time is now, right, to confront your story, confront those demons, go into therapy, grab my book, you know, it does help. Um, and just be at one with, with the emotions that you've been blocking away. All right. And then the other type of man I want to talk to is he doesn't necessarily have to be sexually abused. It doesn't even have to be abused in, in any way. But what he is doing, which I can speak on probably most men, is that they are setting themselves these expectations to fit in with society. Right. And what I mean by that is in their head, in their head, the country that they're living in, it's the norm for the man to be the breadwinner. It's the norm for the man to, um, to be the man, to not cry in front of his family, right? To hold it all together all the time, to, to just lead with this masculine energy all the time because millions of years ago we were cavemen and we were going to hunt our animals, right? Well, newsflash, we're not cavemen anymore, right? And there was a lot of issues in those times with the cavemen and the cave women, like don't you know? And now it's it's not about that. It's it's about getting rid of those expectations that you don't have to act a certain way or think a certain way to fit in what you believe the society's way of living, especially as a man, and to just be like I remember. I never used to cry in front of people, right? Now Britain's got talent. When they had the golden buzzer, I'm crying. Every movie that's emotional. I'm in tears, right? I, I, I've cried today once. I had a podcast this morning and I was crying at one of the stories because emotions is such a beautiful thing. And I think we all have all of those emotions, but a lot of us just have a key that we've thrown away somewhere and we can't find it because it's locking away all those emotions. And I think as men, men need to be healed, you know, and a lot of stigma needs to be changed and taken away. Mm. So that's kind of what I would say. And the long winded answer is to, is to, just break the silence talking to sexually abused men or to just get rid of expectations as a man, you know? Powerful. I need to tell you that I've also hid a lot. I didn't really cry much around people. So (laughs) it's not only a guy thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, People don't handle tears very well usually. So um, I feel that maybe as a society now, not just men or women, Perhaps we need to grow a little bit in terms of how to hold space for people who are sharing emotions. That's, that's also yeah. an issue here. Maybe my community will start doing that. Maybe I need to cry more on my channel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or maybe I need yeah. to start crying on my channel. Who knows? Yeah. It's like crying episodes. Yeah, just every week, once a week, just you crying. There's no context. <laughs> start crying and crying that's it okay right i better buy some onion then yeah 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 okay well perry thank you very much for sharing this for doing this i'm gonna put a link to your book under this video and i'm also gonna share it in my newsletter and um if anybody has questions i'm gonna encourage them to write them here in the comment section or um, I'm also going to leave a link to my site. Maybe they want to write privately. And in case I gather that many questions, maybe we'll do a follow-up with community questions. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how people mm-hmm. are going to react, but I'm still glad that we opened this discussion here. And um, yeah, good luck with promoting the book. I hope it gets Thank you. super big. And with reaching out to other people to podcasts, YouTube channels, and so on. And um, I'm not sure if you're willing to reach out to people because I follow some other men's channels and I, they don't know me. I just follow them. Maybe I'll give you some links under after this discussion is over. Maybe they'll be open. I, I mean, I want to believe that guys out there doing this. So they're um, therapists, facilitators for men to get empowered in their lives, sexuality, professional lives. I feel that they should somehow be open to this you know yeah yeah yeah. i hope so 
Okay. Yeah, I, I so, hope so too. Like I'm really, yeah. I'm going to nag them with messages. Hey, <laughs> this guy's going to write to you. I send him to you, better answer. I demand you respond. Yeah, I'm going to leave yeah. comments. I'm, I'm going to be like the biggest troll until they open up. <laughs> so I have at least two communities in mind. They are both from the United States, but hopefully they'll, they'll be responsive. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So enjoy your evening. Good luck with the book. Like super good luck that it reaches as many people as possible. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe we'll talk in a year from now and see how your yeah. story and the book story, because it's going to be a, a story of its own from now on, how it went. Yeah. 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 Sounds okay. good to me. Thank you for having me on. You're very welcome. See ya. See ya. Bye.